and welcome to Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your commitment to giving common sense a comeback. I'm just going to warn you off the top of the show. We're diving right in today because we've got a heartbreaker of a story for you. You're going to cry. Uh, you're going to be angry, and you should be because this speaks to, I think, the state of our criminal justice system. You know, we talk an awful lot about people who do horrible things, who get a slap on the wrist. And one of the real frustrations we've had is with the bail system. Look, I believe everyone has a constitutional right to reasonable bail. I do believe that. But I think that jurists have lost sight of the element of that that is supposed to protect the public from dangerous people. And our criminal justice system in Seattle and Washington State really seems to be focused on what's best for a suspect or a criminal and not what's best for the community at large. So before I even dive into this exclusive story today, again, it is going to break your heart. It's gonna be difficult to listen to. Some of it's gonna be difficult to watch. We'll give you warnings where appropriate. I wanna introduce you to a dog named Stevie. So Stevie has a remarkable story. Not only is Stevie just the probably the most adorable dog I've, I've ever seen. But Stevie had a really long journey to finding her forever home in Seattle. Uh, in fact, the Port of Seattle back in around 2020 did a story on Stevie and on Stevie's journey from the streets of Qatar to the city of Seattle. Stevie was a stray dog in Qatar, did not have a very good life, ended up being rescued, being brought over, they called her at the time a four-legged globe trotter, made the journey from Qatar to SeaTac Airport, ended up being fostered through a nonprofit called Fur Bay Rescue. And ultimately, Stevie found her forever home in the arms of a young woman named Michelle Michaels. So here you have this adorable little dog that made a journey all the way across the world from Qatar, only to be shot in the head last Thursday and killed in the city of Seattle. Now I'm gonna play a video for you that's from a ring doorbell camera and you don't see it, I will tell you up front, you do not see Stevie being shot and killed. You do hear it. But to set this up for you a little bit, Stevie was at home with her mom, Michelle. Michelle was working inside. Stevie was in the front yard by all witness accounts when a 22-year-old man named Megan Youssef, for no apparent reason, took out his nine millimeter pistol and shot Stevie in the head. Here's the video. So what you see in that video is this young man, this 22 year old walking down the sidewalk you hear a bark, maybe two barks, and immediately a shot's fired. So Megan Youssef has been charged with at least one count of animal cruelty in the first degree. We'll talk about some of the other elements of this case uh, momentarily. And you might be wondering to yourself, okay, is there a reason why he would have walked up to this dog in its owner's yard and shot it in the head? Well, Meg and Youssef tried to come up with every excuse in the book when Seattle police arrived on scene. I'll read a little bit from the court documents. Seattle police wrote, Youssef indicated that he had been bit by Stevie. He said he indicated that it was his left leg, but officers inspected it for injuries. Officers did not locate any skin breaks, redness, or tearing, which would indicate a dog bite. Youssef then stated that the dog pulled on his pant leg. Officers took photographs, but there was no indication of injury or damage to the pant leg, which were blue jeans. So then officers talked to Youssef's mom, who offered this excuse. She told officers that 
This dog has been terrorizing Youssef for approximately 13 years, since he's been walking home from school as a young boy. She said that she has personally been attacked by the dog and that there have been incidents in the past. Except that's just not true. Because as you know, Stevie just came from Qatar a couple years ago, and his owner, Michelle, told officers that Stevie was just four years old and that they'd only been living in that house for two to three years across the street from Youssef and his mom. So this couldn't be, Stevie couldn't be the dog that had been, quote unquote, allegedly attacking Youssef since he was a little boy 13 years ago, walking to and from school. Michelle told the officers she was renting the house. There hadn't been any previous incidents. She said there'd been no prior issues, to her knowledge, with Stevie, and that Stevie had never displayed any type of aggression. And then, of course, officers spoke to witnesses who'd called 911 after they saw this happen. And both of the witnesses officers spoke to said the same thing that there were no indications that Stevie had in any way acted aggressively toward Megan Youssef before he pulled out the gun and shot her. One of the witnesses told officers that from his perspective, Stevie was just standing there when she was shot. The dog was not barking, chasing, or in any way acting aggressively just prior to the shooting. So with all of that in mind, I want you to picture this, a residential neighborhood in Seattle. Your dog is in your front yard minding its own business. When one of your neighbors comes up to your dog and shoots it in the head, what would your expectation be? What would your expectation be for that person when they're arrested for murdering your dog? Well, I guess in the city of Seattle and in King County, that means $10,000 bail. And that means you get to go home the very same day that you appear in court. That means you get to go back to your house across the street from the house where you just killed a dog for no apparent reason. So we asked um, Stevie's owner, Michelle Michaels, who is very upset, and I think that's understandable, but she was willing to come on and talk to us today about what she's been through and about what happened in court. Just gonna start with, uh, it seems like a dumb question, but how are you doing? Okay. I know, I can't, I, every person watching this, his heart I know is just breaking for you. Let's just start, tell me about Stevie. Tell me about what kind of dog Stevie, Stevie was. Stevie was <laughs> just magic. <laughs> I had never met another dog like her before. Um, just the smartest, silliest creature. Uh, I have worked in rescue a lot, and so I've seen a lot of dogs, and there's just something so different about her. And we just, like, completely bonded. I've never experienced anything like it before. <sighs> just from the pictures and the videos, it just seems like she had this just total personality. Just yeah. total, the total human personality. Yeah, she was my baby. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about, we, we, we mentioned it a little bit before you came on, but just the, the, the wild story about Stevie's journey to America. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how, how Stevie came to be um, yeah. Um, with you? Yeah. Um, I'm volunteering for a rescue called Fur Bay Rescue, um, started by these two amazing sisters. Uh, and they, one was a pilot for Qatar Airlines and the other live in Vancouver, BC. And they just started um, helping the street dogs there and the shelter dogs and sending them over to be adopted. Uh, I volunteered for a couple years and Stevie was one of the dogs that I picked up from the airport. Um, and she did a trial adoption with another family for a few days and just wasn't a right fit for them. Uh, and so I picked her up and, and that's just where it all began. My friends fell in love with her instantly and everyone was like, you have to take this dog. She is your dog. And I, then <laughs> the rest is history. He just went with us ever since, every totally. single day. Total foster fail. And I can tell yeah. by the pictures and you guys, uh, you sent some pictures also with your friends and stuff. 
So let's let's talk about um, what happened. You know, we've seen the video. I guess when you heard the gunshot, how how long did it take for you to truly grasp what had happened? I was in complete shock. Um, I just looked instantly out my window <laughs> and saw her laying there. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, I just, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. Um, I ran out instantly and held her in my arms and I still, part of me thought there was something that could be done for her. <laughs> so I was just screaming for help. Um, and I ran her inside as soon as I realized nobody could help. And, and I held her in my arms and <laughs> until her heart stopped. And then it became a little bit more real. Um, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Michelle, did he say anything to you? I, uh, I think he he said something, but I just don't remember. Uh, he was just standing right next to us <laughs> the whole time. I was screaming for help, and he had the gun in his hand still. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you feel like you or your friend you, you were in jeopardy? I. Honestly, couldn't even think about that at the time. Um, looking back, obviously, it's very scary. Um, but in the moment, I just wanted someone to help Stevie, so I didn't even, I didn't even care. <laughs> now, you know, we read the the documents, and he made you know all sorts of excuses, saying, "Oh, this dog's been terrorizing his family for thirteen years," which we know isn't true because because you've only had Stevie for a couple years. Um, you know, suggested that, that Stevie lunged at him, which witnesses say just isn't true, that Stevie was just sitting there at the time. Yeah. Can you, have you thought what, what, what reason in the world there would have been for this man to do this to Stevie? I can't imagine. Um, I, the only thing that I can think about is just having a deep-seated fear of dogs. I don't. And I just wish he knew her. I just really wish he knew who she was. I don't think he would have done that. And she's the sweetest. You are doing much better than than I think I would in in this circumstance. When when you went to court and when this was all, you know, he, he was going to make a first appearance in court, I guess, what was your, your expectation, given the seriousness of what, what he did? What did you think would happen? I um, definitely thought he would be held in jail until the trial. Uh, my friends got right to work researching and figuring out kind of what, would, what next steps would be. Uh, and never in a million years did we think he would just go back across the street from us the next day. <laughs> but I haven't been home. I can't go back home. It's the scariest place to be. You, ha you have not been back home since this happened. I've had friends pick up stuff um, from our house, but I can't. I have not stayed there. So what, I mean, that, that was the first thing that came to my mind too. They gave this guy a $10,000 bail, which I'll tell you is so, so low. I've been covering courts for a long time. That That's insanely low. Um, and he had a gun he shouldn't have had and obviously used it in a way he shouldn't have used it. So can you ever go back? I mean, can you imagine yourself going back to live across the street from this guy? No, um, we've already talked about my roommate and I, Alyssa, who Stevie was her baby too. <laughs> Um, we've spoke to our landlord. He's full, fully supportive of us, and he's uh, just the greatest. He messaged me how much he loved seeing Stevie, excited to see him, and he is just fully in support of us leaving the house and just wants to be with us every step of the way. Uh, but yeah, we can't go back. 
Can I ask you about the police response? Did did the police seem to to take it seriously when when Seattle police showed up? And can you just characterize their their response? Yeah, um, it was a bit of a blur, um, but everybody was very supportive. Um, there's three officers that I remember um, that were in the home, and everybody was just very supportive. Um, for me, I could only think about Stevie, to be honest, and I didn't want personal support or feel like I needed it, but I really appreciate them kind of pushing me through that and staying with me and being there. And they helped me get a hold of my friends and um, all my friends were there very shortly after. Yeah, one of your friends told us that one of the detectives just sat next to you and offered to hold your hand. Yeah, he did. He was very sweet. He was very sweet. He told me I'd never seen something like this before. <laughs> How how has this impacted just your your sense of safety um, and security and you know before and after? Yeah, I uh, I've been talking to a lot of people about this uh, because I've never felt unsafe. Uh, I pretty confident person who I've never felt unsafe in the city. And I know there's a lot of different perspectives on that, but I've always felt very safe and. This is just one of the scariest things. I, I just don't know anymore. I, <clears throat> yeah. Michelle, is there anything that, that the people watching and listening can do, can do for you, can do in Stevie's memory or anything at all? Um, honestly, any dog rescue... Fur Bay specifically is close to my heart. Um, I know my sister has set up a GoFundMe. That's kind of besides the point for me personally, but any dog rescue you can donate to, or if this, this spring, if you plant something in Stevie's name, <laughs> that's what I'll be doing. Do you plan to follow this case and, and be at future hearings or? Yeah, I'll be at every hearing. Um, the next one is in April 22nd, and I will be there. I'll be there in person. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, we've been covering crime stories a lot, and one of the chief concerns is really low punishments or no punishments for people um, and just laps on the wrist. What yeah. would your message be to the prosecutor's office as they pursue this case to trial? Yeah, I need this person to be convicted to the fullest degree. I'm terrified to be in my home. And Stevie is not just an animal. She was my baby. She was a family member. Well, Michelle, again, our heart just breaks for you. And um, what, ha what has happened, obviously, um, since is not right. Um, it's it's not justice, and and Stevie deserves better, and we'll be following this. And um, if there's anything else we can do, you please let us know. Okay, thank you so much. <sighs> That's just about as devastating a story as we've ever talked about on the show. And again, you know, you think about all the factors in this case, and we're in touch with the prosecutor's office because there had been some other information that was floating around that perhaps he did not legally have that firearm, and certainly there would be some sort of charge for discharging a firearm in city limits when he had no reason to do it. And so we're wondering if there are going to be other firearm charges added, and so we will continue to follow up with the prosecutor's office and law enforcement to figure that out. And look, you know, she had mentioned mentioned what her expectation would be at trial. I, I would never expect that he was going to be held until his, his court date. I mean, there are some people who, you know, commit uh, homicides who aren't uh, held until their court dates. Um, you know, their bails are set pretty dang high, though. But when you 
take all of this into consideration and you've got someone who was willing to, by witness accounts, shoot a dog in the head for no reason, that's either someone who has an extreme different indifference for life or that's someone who's not mentally well. And to give them $10,000 bail and then send them on back home to the same neighborhood where they committed the crime uh, is unfathomable to me, particularly when they clearly lied multiple times to law enforcement about the reason for shooting Stevie. Uh, so this is this is really horrifying on so many aspects. It's a failure of the criminal justice system. The other thing is, this is an instance where prosecutors didn't seek a high bail either. And, and this 22-year-old, to the best of their knowledge, has no criminal history. So you go from no criminal history to shooting a dog in the head, and that doesn't raise some alarm bells about an extreme risk to the public. I think prosecutors asked for $15,000 bail at first appearance, and the judge dropped it down to ten. Fifteen dollars $15,000 bail isn't very much either. Uh, and so this is, oh my gosh, just listening to, to Michelle and the heartbreak that she obviously feels. And I don't blame her for not wanting to go back home. So you have this young man who not only took uh, Stevie from her, but also took her sense of security and safety in a city that she otherwise felt safe in and has took her home from her. She's not willing to go back. So now she's working. Th um, this landlord sounds like just a, a absolute world-class human being um, and is going to move out. And I don't blame her over all of this. So again, it's such a heavy story to sh start the show, but it's like when you have something so helpless and so innocent as a dog and, and the ability to shoot that dog in the head and take its life, and then you get back out just like that, $10,000 bail. That's a breakdown in the criminal justice system. And that's a judge in a system that has no care or concern for the safety of the public. It's just wrong. Uh, Nicole said when we were doing this, because Nicole, I come in, Nicole's crying because she's watching the video. She's putting photos together. And she wanted to make sure that we end this segment uh, on just a positive thing that we could all kind of do. Uh, and so as Michelle mentioned, if you want to make a donation to Fur Bay Rescue, um, maybe you could make it in Stevie's name if you're interested. It's furbayrescue.dog, furbayrescue.dog, uh, and that's the organization that uh, helped Stevie find her forever home with Michelle. And you know what? They should have had many, many, many more years uh, of happiness and fun and joy and laughter together, and that was cut short, and that is devastating for any of us who are dog owners. Uh, I know that you guys feel very deeply what Michelle is going through, and my heart just breaks for her. So maybe we can do something uh, for Stevie um, by donating to FurBayRescue.org and helping other dogs like Stevie who came from Qatar for a better life in America, all the way from Qatar, just to be killed in Seattle absolutely devastating. All right, we're going to change gears. Um, we have kind of a light, actually turned into a pretty lighthearted interview um, on, on a very important topic, but you guys will have heard that a judge ruled that Washington State's ban on high-capacity magazines was ruled unconstitutional. Now, there was an emergency stay put in place, so you can't go out and buy them right now, but we had the gun shop owner and the attorney who were behind that ruling, and they're going to join us coming up next. First, uh, if you are thinking about selling your home at any point in 2024, maybe you want to move out of state, maybe you need a, a downsize. I've heard from a lot of people who are downsizing lately. That must be the state of the economy. Uh, but make sure you get an early start on getting your home ready to hit the market. You know, if you need to make cosmetic updates or anything like that, you can get started on that months in advance. So this is as stress free as possible. Our friend Wes Jones also said that even if the Fed doesn't drop interest rates this year, he does expect the real estate market to be better for the rest of 2024, certainly than it was in 2023. If they stay where they're at right now, I actually think that values will stay closer to where they're at. We'll, be, we'll see lower appreciation. We'll see appreciation, but it'll be modest. But if they start to come back down, well, that's when I think we'll start to see more of the multiple offer situations and the bid ups in home sale prices. Yeah. So uh, if you go to sellwithwest.com, sellwithwest.com, you can do a few things. He's going to give you a free market analysis. So you can kind of get an expectation of how your home will perform on the market. And you can use their home value calculator to see how much your home is worth. It might be worth more than you think. Sellwithwest.com, a better way to sell your home. All right. This ruling came down, was it Monday? Monday, because we had... 
no show yesterday, right? So yeah, we're, our days are all screwed up. So we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We had no show yesterday. Uh, so Monday evening, this news came down that Washington State's ban on quote unquote high capacity magazines, because I don't think that 10 rounds is high capacity, um, that it was struck down by a court in Cowlitz County and ruled unconstitutional. So there was just this frenzy in the gun world like, oh, you can go sell these high capacity magazines. We'll get to more of that in a moment. But here's the article from the Seattle Times. Washington's ban on high capacity gun magazines magazines ruled unconstitutional. Cowlitz County judge ruled that it's unconstitutional, but just minutes later, the state Supreme Court issued an emergency order keeping the law on the books while the state appeals the decision. Cowlitz County Superior Court Judge Gary Beshore ruled that Washington's ban on the magazines, which hold more than 10 rounds and have been banned since 2022, violates both the Washington state and U.S. constitutions. So Beshore had issued an immediate injunction uh, and then uh, Attorney General Bob Ferguson filed an emergency appeal to the state Supreme Court to get the law back on the books while this is all continuing down the process. And Michael Johnston, a Washington state Supreme Court commissioner, granted an emergency stay Monday evening, keeping the ban in effect for now. So A.G. Ferguson was all over this on his social media accounts, talking about how he's going to fight for Washington state. Uh, and this is the example of him fighting for Washington state. He said today's decision is incorrect. And we immediately filed a motion asking the state Supreme Court to keep this public safety law in effect. Every court in Washington and across the country uh, to consider challenges to a ban on the sale of high capacity magazines under the U.S. or Washington Constitution has either rejected that challenge or it's been overruled. This law is constitutional. It is also essential to addressing mass shootings in our communities. This law saves lives and I will continue to defend. It. So there was like, I want to say an hour to two hours, maybe 90, a 90 minute period of time on Monday where gun shops that had some of this, um, these high capacity under the law, I'm just going to use their phrasing, these magazines still in stock that they had to stop selling, they were then able to start selling them again. And so if you bought one of these magazines uh, within that little 90 minute window, then you get to keep it. The government isn't, at least not for the time being, going to come into your home and take that away from you. Uh, but uh, we asked Pete Serrano, who's running for attorney general as a Republican, but he's also with the Silent Majority Foundation, and they spearheaded this case on behalf of Wally Wentz. So Wally Wentz is a heck of a character, as you're about to find out. He is the owner of Gators Custom Guns in Kelso, Washington. So he was um, the plaintiff in this case to actually file suit and challenge challenge the constitutionality of the ban on these magazines. Both Pete and Wally were kind enough to join us to react to the ruling and then the very quick stay on that ruling. Pete and Wally, welcome to Undivided. Thanks, Brandy. Appreciate well, you having us. Yeah, congratulations. I know it was sort of a short-lived celebration. Wally, did you guys send any, uh, sell any, quote, high-capacity magazines in that two-hour period? A lot. I have no idea how many. You really did? We really did. Dang. So, because my husband, uh, he walks in the door. This is how I found out about it. My husband walks in the door. I'm already home from work. And he goes, oh, I just got an email from the gun shop in Bellevue. And they said I can come buy high capacity <laughs> magazines until, <laughs> until, uh, until they run out. And so that's how I found out that the ruling had come down. So, Wally, did you just send out an email to folks or something, letting them know, like, hey, come and get them? I, I got a phone call, a brief phone call from Pete that we were live and got the injunction. 11 minutes later from a stone cold nap on my day off, I had shoes and overalls on and, and mama was texting people that we were going to open this door. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, what were the reactions that you were getting from your customers? I, I met my youngest son, my retail manager here. Uh, in 30 minutes, we had magazines out ready to sell and open the doors. And we ran like that until Pete called again and said, that's it. They got the stay. Yeah. So, uh, Pete, did you expect that, that the attorney general would very quickly seek a stay? Well, I, I knew they were going to seek it immediately. I didn't know it'd be within four minutes. And more importantly, I didn't know it'd be granted in about 90 to 95 minutes. Um, it, look, nothing moves at the speed of government when it's in the favor of government, but when it's in the favor of the people, it moves beyond the speed of government where uh, it'll, you know, like molasses, just roll downhill. Uh, yeah. But when the government wants it to move, we've seen miracles happen. What does that tell you? I mean, is there anything nefarious there or just that Bob Ferguson anticipated that the ruling wouldn't be in his favor and he was ready to go? 
Well, we knew it was teed up. They teed it up, I think, uh, as of March 11th after the hearing. In, in fact, they tried to tee it up before the hearing. Um, I, I think I've mentioned this uh, in various locations that pre-hearing March 11th, the uh, AG's office actually emailed to the Supreme Court and said, hey, you know, if an injunction is issued from the bench today, we're going to heads up, we're filing this. Uh, so this was like March 9th, 10th, something like that. So they knew that if it was coming down, they were ready. I knew they had it briefed. There was no question about that. What surprised me is between 314 of getting it, 319, getting an email uh, hey, the Supreme Court, we're transmitting this. And within minutes, the Supreme Court's responsive to them. And then within 90 minutes, the commissioner rules. It's a 55 page opinion. Uh, that to me, I don't I don't I don't buy that. Mm. It, it puts a lot of questions in my mind of how it moved. Um, you know, certainly the commissioner could have skimmed it, but I don't think he fully vetted it. Interesting. And obviously, the, the Washington State Supreme Court is a pretty politically, ideologically aligned court with the attorney general. So I don't know what kind of I don't foresee a favorable and anything from them. So where where is the trajectory of this case in your mind right now for you? Yeah, so I mean, it, there's kind of like the levels of fighting, right? The interim, the immediate is deal with the stay. We've got a brief, uh, re a responsive brief due Friday. They have a reply brief due on Tuesday and on Wednesday afternoon. We're back before the same commissioner to address the stay question. Um, again, that's just really nuts and bolts trying to figure out what happens today, tomorrow, and in the interim. Uh, simultaneously, the state's already appealed the injunction to the Supreme Court. We know that'll be pretty fast-tracked. Um, and then the beauty of the opinion is, again, it is 55 pages, but the judge, Judge Basher, analyze both the Washington and federal constitutional issues. And under that circumstance, if the Supreme Court either dodges the uh, the federal Supreme Court issues or the federal constitutional issues, or somehow they mess it up, we'll have a clear uh, path to Washington, D.C. and United States Supreme Court. So I think this thing does go all the way. I mean, fortunately, this is when, you know, back when Wally reached out to us through Washington gun law, through Bill Kirk, um, you know, we knew we had the right plaintiff who was actually willing to fight this. Uh, there are a lot of folks that say they are, and then things get tight, things get hot, and then they back off. And that's not just for gun cases. That's just generally as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Wally and his team have been phenomenal. Not only have they supported Silent Majority Foundation's work on their behalf, but they've also been, look, we're in the trenches. You know, we're not running. We're not ducking. We're not dodging. And we'll look for each other and yell for cover when needed. Well, you know why that doesn't surprise me, that your description of Wally? <laughs> I just met him, but Wally, uncross your arms. What does your shirt say? It says f off, commie. <laughs> it's my favorite guest ever. <laughs> yeah, I think you got the right client there, Pete. Um, Wally, can I just ask you as a gun shop owner, you know, it's not just the magazine. I, and, and first, let's just start with the high capacity issue. And that's really one of my central issues with this is it feels like they don't know anything about guns. Like, I'm not even a gun owner. I mean, my husband is, but I even know that 10... 10 rounds isn't high capacity. And so it's sort of that issue of, you know, that doesn't even seem like someone who's ever, you know, even researched this issue. But as a gun shop owner, with everything that's been coming down, you know, the ban on semi-automatic assault weapons, as they call them, the new law that was just put through that puts a lot of security mandates on um, gun shops that are very costly, how has it impacted business? Well, uh, a meatball guess of, the effects of House Bill 1240 and House Bill 5078 is accounts for roughly 30 to 40 percent given on seasonal conditions of my entire business retail wise. Wow. When does that go into effect? Both have been in effect and we are fighting both. Oh, um, wait. 57, oh I'm so sorry. 50, yeah. 5078 was a large capacity magazine from 2022. 1240 was a so-called assault weapons ban from 2023. Um, and so, you know, again, Silent Majority Foundation, we're fighting both. 1240 is a bit of a slower roll. We got kicked around from Grant County to Thurston County. But again, you know, I will tell you this, uh, and it's it's not often that I say this. So <laughs> take it for the grain of salt. 
Bob Ferguson did us a favor in going after Wally in Cowlitz County. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, quite frankly, the stage has figured they'd have a slam dunk under the Consumer Protection Act because other folks have settled in King and I believe Pierce County, which are obviously very different than Cowlitz County. Uh, especially when you have not just, you know, uh, population, but judicially. And so when they came after Wally, there was no reason for us to move it to Thurston County. That's their playbook. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, not highly complimentary of Ferguson and his team, but going after Wally did us a huge favor where we wouldn't file it in one county and then get moved to Thurston County. So I guess that's one of the good things. But to Wally's point, I mean, gun owners are are slowly bleeding to death and and many have already had to close doors you know fortunately for wally he's got other inventory and he's been able to limp along but there are folks who are even smaller and just they've called us and they're like my dream's gone where's america yeah well wally you mentioned the 30 to 40 percent of your overall business revenue that's coming in for those two but you haven't even had to implement the new law that was passed in Olympia this session that requires all these upgraded security features and, you know, keeping video surveillance and um, a certain level of insurance. Have you calculated what that's going to cost your business? No, I'm, I'm working on the premise the the limp along as described by Pete, that that's sustainable at a lower rate and I don't have to lay anybody off yet. Mm. The effects of the bill you're talking about that goes into effect one July 25 is gonna be Hiroshima for a lot of brick and mortar FFLs. Yeah, Pete, let me ask you this and we'll we'll, um, end here. You are also running for attorney general And if you are the attorney general, it's your job and your obligation to defend laws that have been passed by the Washington state legislature, is it not? It is. But, you know, I've been very clear. If it's not constitutional, I will not defend it. So what would you have done in this position? Uh, I would have, as I like to say, played Toro with this, you know, been a matador and just had the said, okay, here's the bill. I'm not defending it. You know, if Alliance for Gun Responsibility, who lobbied for it, uh, wants to take it on, guess what? Silent Majority of Foundation will come ground up and the AG's office will file a couple of amicus briefs on behalf of the constitutional principles. All right, Wally. That's how we're going to do this. Back to the people. Wally, you believe him? I believe him with all my heart or he wouldn't be my counselor. I love it. Well, you're funny. I'm going to come visit you next time I'm out there in Cowlitz County. Well, um, congratulations on the ruling. Um, I have said, and I, I don't know, Wally, if you listen to the show, I am... Like I said, I'm not a gun person per se. I am a constitutional, uh, a, a big fan of the Constitution. And um, whenever it's infringed, no matter what it is, you know, I make a living off the First Amendment. And so I don't want to see the Second Amendment infringed because I don't want to see the First Amendment inf- infringed. So I'm glad someone's fighting for it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Yeah, so we appreciate Pete and Wally joining us. Wally's definitely a character. I love that he wore the appropriate shirt for the occasion. Uh, So we will now see. I mean, certainly it's a win to have a court, and that's the baseline now in that case. Say that's unconstitutional. That's a huge win for them. Now, I don't have a lot of faith in the Washington State Supreme Court to make any decisions that aren't highly ideological. Um, And so I I anticipate that this might be, you know, a, a case that the U.S. Supreme Court takes up at some point. But interesting to hear him say that even in that short, window of time it did not take long for word to get out and people to come in and start buying those magazines until they had to stop selling them really i i I just thought well people probably won't do that but it sounds like they absolutely did okay coming up next we're gonna get to a double dose of unbelievable uh i have some criticism of our friends in the media per the usual and also uh, of the washington state democratic party and their plans should they get super majorities in the state house and senate first i have encouraged you guys to take the first mark challenge man if you haven't yet, you really don't know what you're missing and the the stress it takes out of your life dealing with your insurance needs. So First Mark Insurance has been in this business for a long time. They're insurance brokers, and they're going to be able to handle your insurance needs 
and it never costs you a dime. You pay for your insurance as you regularly would, and they're out there. They're checking on whether they've got you the best rate, whether they've got you the coverage that you need. The First Mark Challenge just entails you coming to them uh, and going through your current insurance, talking to them about what you need. Maybe you need better insurance. Maybe you need a better rate. We could all save a little bit of money right now. They're going to go out and do their thing, and they're going to come back to you with their recommendations. Dave Taylor is the CEO of First Mark, and he says right now is a really critical time for people to have an insurance broker in their corner. I really want to encourage folks, don't try to navigate this current market by yourself. Mm -hmm. I believe you need to get with a broker. Okay, obviously I'd love them to come to First Mark, but at a minimum they need to be with a broker that works with numerous carriers that can give them the advice they need and really help them navigate this right now because it's complicated. Yeah, and I'm telling you, I just had an email today with First Mark because my umbrella policy is renewing and they give you a, like a month or two months heads up like, hey, here's the cost. It's renewing. Do you want to change anything? And then I was supposed to send them some sort of document and forgot. So they just gave me a nice, polite email like, hey, you guys send us over that doc. Would one of the big carriers do that? No, they just let your insurance lapse and be like, Matt, you're not covered. Not First Mark. So FirstMarkInsurance.com, FirstMarkInsurance.com. Again, you just don't know what you're missing out on until you do it. Uh, and the very best part is they work for you. All right, a double dose of unbelievable because we didn't have a show yesterday. So why not give you two unbelievable segments? Because there is just so much out there. God, we had to leave a lot on the cutting room floor today before we came on because we had those two fantastic interviews for you. So uh, by now you have, because you watch or listen to a show, where we actually cover things that need to be covered. So by now, you have heard multiple times about Ian Golosh, the anti-Semitic woke activist teacher in the Seattle Public School District. Well, it's very curious to me that not very many other media outlets in Seattle are talking about this story. Let's get to it in our first edition of Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, just a quick refresher on Ian Golosh. If you're not familiar, he's a Seattle public school teacher. In fact, I think he's in charge of the social studies program at a Seattle high school. He has a long track record of activism that borders on completely being inappropriate. In 2020, he was harassing news cameras, helping his students go into the King County Jail to hold a protest. He uh, was failing students in his class for saying that uh, boys couldn't get pregnant. He was posting uh, very anti-Semitic screeds on his personal Facebook. He had up these pro-Palestine slash pro-Hamas posters outside his classroom. And then what I thought was the point where, okay, no one can ignore it anymore. This came last week. No one can possibly ignore this guy anymore. The Seattle Public School District can't possibly stand by this guy any longer. The media is going to have to start covering it. And that came when um, a social media kind of news entity called Accuracy in Media went and tracked Ian Golosh down and talked to him about some of his Facebook posts that deny Hamas atrocities from October 7th. Were women murdered at the music festival? They were. Was that justified? Yes. Anti-Semitic educator Ian Golosh is openly pro-Hamas and also endorses ethnic cleansing. What do you think about Ian Golosh and his anti-Semitism? What are your thoughts? How has he not been fired yet? I've read his posts. He's anti-Semitic. Mr. Golosh, how are you? I think one child dying is terrible but I would never endorse killing women at a music festival. But you said that was merely resistance to oppression, is that right? No, that's not what I said. Your post said that oppressors don't get to choose the form of resistance used against them. That is true. Well, then was what happened to Israel on October 7th justified? Yes. The rape of women at a music festival was justified. Where's the evidence that there was rape? Were women murdered at the music festival? They were. Was that justified? Yes. The murder of innocent women just attending a music festival, that was justified in your opinion? No. I think resistance against Israel is justified, yes. So that was the report filed by Accuracy and Media, which again details, and then you hear it in Ian Golosh's own words, he's not he's not backing down from what he said. And for anyone who might think, well, he, you know, has First Amendment rights, he can, you know, do what he wants on his free time, this isn't his free time. In fact, there were students there with him during that interview that he had taken off school grounds. In 2020, when he was harassing news crews, he was with students for a protest inside the King County Jail. 
And I'm sorry, you are held to a higher standard when you are tasked with influencing the minds of other people's children. And when you're a public school employee, so after that, and we played a clip of it, maybe it was Monday or last week, and um, gosh, I just thought, there's no way. This has to be the line for SPS. And I still don't know whether it will be, right? Um, because SPS is hiding behind it. So we don't talk about personnel issues, and we're looking into this to find out the facts of the situation, as if him saying that blatantly needs to be investigated. No, those are the facts, and he's sticking to them. But I think what really just got to me yesterday is the fact the media won't pick this up. It is insane. Think about this. Think about this. If this was a right-wing, like, neo-Nazi teacher who was justifying the murder of Jews, do you think that that would not be the lead story on the 5 o'clock news across all four major TV stations in Seattle? Do you think that the Seattle Times wouldn't already have done five to ten stories on it? Of course they would have, and it would be justified. That level of outrage and coverage from the media would be justified if you had some sort of right-wing teacher, like white supremacist or some neo-Nazi who was talking and justifying what happened to innocent Israeli women, that they should be murdered, denying that they were raped. But because this is a leftist teacher who is, believes in all these social justice issues, and because the left has become inexplicably beholden to the pro-Palestine, anti- or pro-Hamas, really, movement, the media doesn't do anything. Nicole, I had you look. The only two outlets you could find that aren't us mm -hmm. and are kind of conser the conservative media landscape right. was Como News. Right. So hello, Como News and only mm -hmm, Como mm -hmm. News. Como. And MyNorthwest.com, but is that Which, a Jason Rant story? Well, it's Jason, but they, yeah. Yeah. It's not the KTTH site. They put it on the My, My Northwest. So. Right. So mm -hmm. the only like mainstream news outlet in the entire city of Seattle mm -hmm. to cover this issue is Como News. Unless somebody can find something. Different. Unless you but can find, unless we've missed it. We searched Ian Golosh. There's some old, yeah. you know what Nicole did find? She found the story from 2020 from when I was at Fox 13. Mm -hmm. And I did a story on Ian Golosh blocking news cameras and harassing news crews in, in the jail. That's the last time that Nicole can find a story with the mainstream media. Hate to toot my own horn. Toot, toot. And actually, there, in between there, there's been a couple other stories yeah. after you left Q that, um, that the New York Post has picked up mm -hmm. on, that Fox News has picked up on, but still. Seattle mm -hmm. media. Seattle media. They're, Tell me yeah, that's not, not ideological. Mm -hmm. Tell me that is not a clear and present bias. And we have a story coming up in National published in the free press, this longtime NPR employee who talks about this very thing, talks about this deep-seated bias that is prolific in newsrooms across the country, including NPR. And as I read that coming up, you're going to see a lot of the reasons why we, we, we see coverage like this of Ian Golosh. It's just inherently ideological, deep-seated bias, and really... Newsrooms that don't allow pushback, they don't allow, you know, the, the um, dissent, occasional as it may be in a newsroom, to happen. Just think about that again. No one can, no one can challenge my argument on this. I, I really, really, if you want to come on and debate and you think that you have a justifiable reason as to why what Ian Golosh said isn't being covered, and if a right-wing neo-Nazi said the same stuff, that it, that it would be covered in a different way— Please, I, I welcome it because you can't challenge that. And it just proves, it proves the media bias and what the media chooses to focus on. It is truly unbelievable. All right, in our second dose of unbelievable, when Democrats tell you what their plan is, when they spell it out for you in black and white, you have to believe them. Let's get to it. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the Stranger came out with an article about Washington State Democrats and the possibility that they could capture super majorities in 2024. And of course, this is like a fever dream of The Stranger. And they wrote this whole article talking about the individual seats that Democrats would need to pick up. But more than that, they talked to some of the leading Democrats in Olympia 
about what they would do with supermajorities. Oh, and you can just see them salivating over the possibilities of how they could further ruin our state if they have supermajorities. And in case you're not familiar, supermajority is two thirds. So in the House and Senate, Democrats already control them. But if they can get those majority up to, majorities up to two thirds, that does a couple things. One, veto proof. You could have a Republican governor in the governor's office. Wouldn't matter. He vetoes something, they'd reverse it. If, as long as they had uh, consistency and strength within their caucuses, two-thirds. So that's significant. The other thing they can do is they can start to try to make changes to the Washington state constitution. So let's dive into this article from The Stranger. Um, Rich Smith writes, the party currently boasts sizable majorities in the state legislature, holding 29 of 49 seats in the state Senate and 58 of 98 seats in the state House. With Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, scaring the bejesus out of normies and with favorable new political boundaries. You see that? Favorable new political boundaries. Why is that? Because they sued over redistricting and they bragged that they turned Republican districts into Democratic districts. This is why they did it. This is the stranger acknowledging it, right? Favorable new boundaries. Interesting. Democrats appear poised to increase their majorities. If they defend a few easily defensible seats and win a handful of plausibly winnable seats, they could even secure supermajorities in both chambers. Assuming voters elect a Democratic governor, which seems probable, Democrats would then have the power to amend the state constitution provided they all agree on what they'd like to change. I love it how the stranger says that like it's a good thing. You know how cringy that is to cheer on a party to complete and total unchecked power? You know how cringy that is as a media outlet? That's so gross and weird that you would want any, any political institution to have complete control over your lives. Rich Smith, gross. Uh, so Senator Jamie Peterson tells the stranger, he chairs the Washington Senate Democratic Campaign Committee. He said, quote, it's pretty exciting, heavy stuff to think about. What kinds of stuff might be possible for us? They're literally excited about that prospect. It says in a phone interview, both Senator Peterson and his counterpart in the House, Representative Mon Monica Stonier, mentioned changing the school bond threshold to a simple majority codifying abortion protections, and adjusting some language to allow the state to experiment with a universal basic income program. Great. Sign me up for that. But here's the thing. Again, when Democrats tell you what they're going to do, believe them. And this is something that the chair of the Washington State Democratic Party, as you well know because we talked about it on the show, has said is her goal. She tweeted it out. She said, my goal for 2026 is that with super majorities, we can clean up the constitution. She, I mean, her goal is a little more conservative than the stranger thinks it can happen in 2024, but Shasti Conrad is saying 2026, and we warned about this. Even if you are a Democrat, think about, think about how Weird it is to want a political party, which is essentially a corporation of groupthink, to have complete unchecked power, particularly a political party that over the last 15 years especially has sent the state down the gutter on critical issues. Why would you not want a government where there's a little bit of a dissent, some opposing ideas, where they have to have to do something as important as override a veto or as important as change the state constitution, the very protections that you have as citizens. Why would you not want there to be a really high bar to do those things? Giving one party the ability to do that, that is certifiably insane. And I'll tell you what they're going to do with it. You know, they want to say, oh, we'll codify abortion protections or, oh, universal basic income. Fine. That's all weird. I mean, abortion protections, I don't have an issue with that. Um, universal basic income, I have a huge issue with. And trying to make it easier to pass taxes, I have a huge issue with. But I know exactly what they'll do. And it'll be one of the first things they do. They will seek to get rid of the right of voters to pursue referendums and initiatives. A hundred percent, I have no question in my mind. Now, keep in mind, if you want to change the state constitution, 
not only do you have to pass those amendments via a supermajority through the House and the Senate, and it has to uh, uh, make it past the governor, those will then go, if that, those laws are passed and those amendments are passed, they still have to go to voters. So keep in mind, and I think voters in Washington state over our history have amended the state constitution something like 100 times. So there is that fail safe. But that doesn't mean that Democrats wouldn't try. And think about all of the attacks on the initiative process. And think about who uses the initiative process, who seeks to overturn bills via referendum. It's conservatives. It's typically people who aren't happy with the laws that are being introduced and passed in Olympia. So really, more and more so, the only people using initiatives and referendums are conservatives. So if you have Democrats with super majorities, you don't think that they would try to strengthen their power even further by taking away the last remaining check on it, which is the check from the people? Keep in mind, Lori Jenkins, remember when the initiatives uh, were certified and sent to the legislature? You remember what Speaker of the House, a Democrat, Lori Jenkins said? Here's a reminder. I'm very saddened when I think about why the initiative process was established in this state. Um, to, you know, have a populist approach uh, to, I mean, it was really like the big railroad barons that, that folks didn't want taking over the state and they wanted the people to be able to legislate. So now what do we have is an ultra wealthy multimillionaire buying his way onto the ballot and putting initiatives on the ballot that are gonna benefit his ultra wealthy status. Saddened, remember? She said she was saddened by the initiative process. So if the Speaker of the House is saddened by the initiative process, if the state Democratic Party and progressive entities are going to make concerted efforts to harass and intimidate lawful signature gatherers, you really don't think that if they get what they say they want, super majorities, to do what they say they want to do, clean up the state constitution, you don't think initiatives? You don't think referendums? And getting that out is one of the very first things they're going to do? That should scare the hell out of every single Washingtonian who believes that the government should work for them, regardless of political party, regardless of your personal ideology. Again, when they tell you what they're going to do, do not be surprised when they ultimately do it. I asked uh, you guys in our daily subscriber show poll today whether you think they're bold enough. Do you think that Democrats, if they get a supermajority, are actually bold enough to try to pass an amendment or a law that removes voter initiatives from the state constitution? Again, it still would have to go through the people. But then we know how much they lied to get the things they want. So a lot of you are saying, yes, that you do think that they're bold enough to do just that. There was a little dissent. Hugh Hendrickson said, if this were merely a law, they would do it in a heartbeat. But instead, this is a change to the state constitution, which you rightly point out, requires approval of voters. And there's no way voters would give up this prerogative. You don't think so? <laughs> I, I, given how dishonest campaigns are, I honestly would not put it. Voters in King County got rid of their right to vote for a new sheriff. What's any different about this? says the legislature could pass it, but it would backfire on them when the no campaign demonstrates how clueless and feckless these D's really are. Again, I don't want to be in a position to find out whether voters would approve it, whether they could convince enough Democratic voters to approve it. Uh, let's see here. Some more comments from subscribers. Lynn says, tragically, yes. Jeff says, absolutely. Shasti, as you point out, even bragging on X that she has talked about it for a, a year now. Now that the stranger's talking about it, legit terrifying. Douglas says, silly question, Brandy, of course they would. Anything to push forward their demented ideology. For the record, it would also scare the hell out of me to have Republicans have a supermajority. I don't want that either. I want divided government. I want checks and balances wherever we can have them. I don't want one party sitting there grading its own test and giving itself an A++++++ every session when it deserves an F. And I certainly don't want them taking away the ability of the people they serve to say that they're not happy with something that they push through. Uh, Joel says, these politicians have no shame. They would make this a Marxist uh, state, which is most, mostly is anyway. It would definitely, I would definitely move out of the state. Uh, yeah, I agree. And a lot of people are saying if that happened, they would move out of the state. And, and gosh, at some point, there is even a, 
There is even a juncture where I might move out of the state, which maybe Democrats would love. I can't give them that win. Uh, all right, we're going to dip into national. I know we're going long, but we didn't have a show yesterday. Nicole, you have any problem with going long today? Nah. Nah. Ah, let's do it. What do we have to do, you know? That's right. We ditched everyone yesterday. <laughs> uh, all right. I've got to say, I love the free press. I think the free press is the best news entity in the entire world right now. So it was started by Barry Weiss, who was a columnist at the New York Times. She was conservative and she left the New York Times because basically it was groupthink and there was no room for dissent and conservative voices were not allowed and conservative ideas were not allowed. So anyway, she started the free press and one of the things I love about the free press is they have a lot of guest editorials from people who are dealing with some of these insane cultural issues and um, just issues at the core of what's going on with our country, like the failure of the media. So they published an op-ed from a guy named Yuri Berlinger. You might know him. He's been at NPR for 25 years. In fact, he's still at NPR. In, in case, unless he was fired over the last 24 hours, which I'm sure they're thinking about it very hard. So he was so frustrated and is so frustrated with the state of things at NPR, with their clear and present political bias, that he's putting his job on the line to write this article in the free press to expose some of the things happening at NPR. And one of the reasons I'm reading it, I mean, we all know that NPR is hopelessly biased. We know that. But the reason I want to go through, and I'm going to read quite a bit of this for you, I encourage you to go read it yourself and to subscribe to the Free Press. One of the reasons I want to go through it is it speaks to what's happening with the media at large. The issue we just talked about, about Seattle news outlets ignoring this anti-Semitic teacher who's excusing the murder of Jewish people. The, the issues he points out are true for, I would argue, most mainstream uh, news operations in the United States today. So the headline of this article, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. And so in it, he goes through a couple examples, and I'll get to the key takeaways. But he goes through some stories where he personally on the inside, like he's trying to fix this stuff. He's trying to raise concerns about like, hey, are we really doing our job here and being fair? He brings up Russian collusion and how NPR covered the uh, whole debate around did Donald Trump try to collude with Russia? And he said when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. Russiagate quietly faded from our programming. So here they'd been talking about it day in, day out. Mueller report comes out, no credible evidence of collusion, and they just sort of quietly stop talking about it. He wrote, it's one thing to swing and miss on a major story. Unfortunately, it happens. You follow the wrong leads. You get misled by sources you trusted. You're emotionally invested in a narrative and bits of circumstantial evidence never add up. It's bad to blow a big story. What's worse, he says, is to pretend it never happened, to move on with no mea culpas, no self-reflection. Especially when you're expert, when you expect high standards of transparency from public figures and institutions, but don't practice those standards yourself. That's what shatters trust and engenders cynicism about the media. That's it. It's the one of the best articles I've ever read, mm -hmm. talking about the state of the media right now. How many big stories have you had nationally that turned out just to not be true, or that the media ignored and turned out to be true? And you didn't have some sort of apology or retraction or whatever was necessary. So you have these institutions where their job is to hold other people accountable, but they're not willing to be accountable themselves. That's how you lose trust. Another example he gives, Hunter Biden's laptop story. New York Post does it. All the media, mainstream media, even social media entities like Twitter, they completely squash it. They're like, that's not true. We're not covering it. Twitter's like, you can't even share the link to it. Uh, but in this article, Yuri says the laptop story was newsworthy. But the timeless journalistic instinct of following a hot story lead was being squelched. During a meeting with colleagues, I listened as one of NPR's best and most fair-minded journalists said it was good we weren't following the laptop story because it could help Trump. When the essential facts of the New York Post reporting were confirmed and the emails verified independently about a year and a half later, we could have fessed up to our misjudgment. But like Russian collusion, we didn't make the hard choice of transparency. Another example he talks about, the lab leak theory, that COVID-19 came out of a lab in Wuhan, China. And when that first came out as a possibility, you know, all the, all the Fauci's and everybody was like, that's not, no, no. And so it was squashed. Couldn't even talk about it. It would be flagged as misinformation on social media. And NPR followed right in line. 
Yuri writes, over the course of the pandemic, a number of investigative journalists made compelling, if not conclusive, cases for the lab leak. But at NPR, we weren't about to swivel or even tiptoe away from the insistence with which we backed the natural origin theory. We didn't budge when the Energy Department, the federal agency with the most expertise about laboratories and biological research, con concluded, albeit with low confidence, that a lab leak was the most likely explanation for the emergence of the virus. Instead, when they came out with that conclusion, NPR did a story on it, but began that story by asserting confidently that, quote, the scientific evidence overwhelmingly points to a natural origin for the virus. So even when disproven, more likely than not, they, they were so incapable of admitting that they didn't pursue that possibility with the vigor that journalism demands, that they simply restated what they've been stating all along. Oh, the Energy Department says this, but we, we think that the evidence, we NPR, what? Who are you? How qualified are you to say, oh, it's probably still natural origin because you're trying to cover your ass. So there's a couple important takeaways and, and um, explanations about what happened at NPR. Like what happened? But again, apply it to the media ecosystem at large. And I give Yuri Berlinger a lot of credit because not only is he, he didn't just like the first time he spoke out, he writes an article in the free press. No, it sounds like he has been frustrated for years trying to get his colleagues to really consider whether they're living up to their obligations. So he was trying to get to the bottom of why is our newsroom like this? Why have we lost like all interest and in, in all curiosity? So he did something interesting. He says, concerned by the lack of viewpoint diversity, I looked at voter registration for our newsroom, which is brilliant. In DC, where NPR is headquartered and many of us live, I found 87 registered Democrats working in editorial positions and zero Republicans, none. This guy cared so much, he pulled the voter registration database on the people in editorial positions, 87 Democrats, not a single Republican. So he, I mean, he has balls because May 3rd, 2021, he says he not only did that, but he told his colleagues he did it. <laughs> he brought those findings to an all hands editorial staff meeting. When he suggested they had a diversity of opinion problem, the response wasn't hostile. He said it was worse. It was met with profound indifference. So they, a newsroom that's, again, supposed to be an unbiased newsroom that gets national funding from taxpayers. He told them, hey, I've noticed this is a serious issue. I even went as far as to pull up with the, with the data and the information and voter registration. And they didn't care. They were completely indifferent to it, to it he said. Uh, I think I have one more, Nicole. I, I might not have put it in there. Let me open it up quick here. Sorry, free press four. You got it? Okay, I just didn't have it in my thing. So where do you go from here? Because he talks about how racial justice and all this stuff factors into it, which again, apply this to every newsroom in the country. He said there's an unspoken consensus about the stories we should pursue and how they should be framed. It's frictionless, one story after another about instances of supposed racism, transphobia, signs of the climate apocalypse, Israel doing something bad, and the dire threat of Republican policies. It's almost like an assembly line. He says race and identity became paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed their race, gender, and ethnicity, among other questions, and had to enter it into a centralized tracking system. We were given unconscious bias training sessions. A growing DEI staff offered regular meetings imploring us to start talking about race. Monthly dialogues were offered for women of color and men of color. Non-binary people of color were included too. He says, with declining ratings, sorry levels of trust, and an audience that has become less diverse over time, which is fascinating because he pointed to some information that says that their audience is actually, as they do all this DEI stuff, getting increasingly white. He says the trajectory for NPR is not promising. Two paths seem clear. We can keep doing what we're doing, hoping it will all work out, or we could start over with the basic building blocks of journalism. We could face up to where we've gone wrong. News organizations don't go in for that kind of reckoning. But there's a good reason for NPR to be the first. We're the only ones with the word public in our name. Amen. You have to go read that story if you haven't. It speaks to so much of what is wrong with the current media ecosystem and how it is failing, utterly failing the country. 
Now, it might be pleasing, you know, 50% of the country that aligns with it ideologically, but it's failing them too. It's failing them too because it's not covering things truthfully, not covering things with the doggedness that the American people deserve, and with the power that's bestowed on us by the founding of our country and the founders of our country, the power that's bestowed on us as journalists to do what needs to be done to tell the truth and to hold powerful people accountable. One of the best assessments of what's wrong with the current media ecosystem that I have ever, ever read. All right, we're going to get to questions and comments here before we roll on in to our closing sanity check. First, I have been uh, talking to Zach Abraham with Bulwark Capital just endlessly about the craziness of the market and how you only have one retirement. You have to make sure that it's properly protected against risk. And that's what Zach Abraham and his team at Bulwark Capital specialize in. For instance, we talked on the show last week about uh, Tesla stock, which has just you know been such a popular stock for so long, finally starting to come back down to earth. My opinion, the bloom has fallen off the rose with Tesla, and it was always going to happen because the price of the stock was so far out in front of what the reality was. And you knew a lot of this stuff was vaporware all the way along. But when you got a bunch of shareholders that are dyed in the wool and part of the cult, um, you know, they just they'll keep pushing the stock up, pushing the stock up. But you just know eventually, you know, adults know that. Just because I can throw a baseball really high in the air and I can throw it so high you'll lose sight of it, it doesn't mean it went to orbit. I would bet you every dollar I've got that baseball's going to land on the ground. And Tesla's just in the process of landing on the ground. Yeah, so managing your retirement portfolio is much more difficult than just looking at the stock market uh, and trying to pick winners and losers. Zach and his team at Bulwark Capital, they have an extensive team that's monitoring all sorts of facets of the economy to make sure that your portfolio is properly protected against risk. It doesn't mean that they don't want to make sure that you get gains. Of course, that's part of the job, right? Uh, But especially if you're nearing retirement and in this year, election year, global unrest, all of that, there are some particular issues that definitely need your attention or need the attention of an expert like Zach and his team. So I suggest just having a free know your risk portfolio review with Bulwark Capital. Absolutely no pressure. In fact, they don't even let anyone invest with them at their first meeting. You only get one retirement. Don't risk it. Schedule your free risk review now at knowyourriskradio.com. That's knowyourriskradio.com. Investment advisory services offered through Trek Financial LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Investments involve risk and are not guaranteed. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All right, questions and comments. We'll start with a $20 super chat we missed because it came through at the end of Monday's show. Matt Matthew Adams said, Brandy, please talk about the Central Kitsap School levy measure on the ballot for the 23rd of April. Thanks. Um, And he says he's the chair of the against committee. Now, Central Kitsap, which one was the one with the sign stealing? That was North Kitsap? Mm -hmm. Yes. So similar issue. Have you had any sign thieves, Matthew? That's what I'm curious about. (laughs) Um, But yeah, send us some more information on it for sure. Greg Anderson says of the, uh, I imagine this is about the 22 year old who shot and killed uh, Stevie the dog. Greg Anderson said, so this fellow should be taken out of society and ultimately given a lengthy prison sentence. I agree. If you're willing to shoot a dog in the head for no reason, you're willing to shoot a human in the head for no reason. Well, you should be getting mental help at least. Uh, Mental help at the least. And look, he is lucky that someone wasn't armed because if someone came up and shot my dog in the head and I was armed, they'd be dead. They'd be dead because you can, because you, that would be a threat to you. Somebody comes up and shoots your dog and they're armed and clearly unhinged. Sorry. That's, that's mm-hmm. just the truth. And he when would be dead. walked out, the yeah. gun was still pointed at the dog. I mean, he's still got the gun drawn. Just insane. Mm-hmm. Krista M., this poor woman has to be so traumatized and scared. My heart is so broken for her. Oh, mine too. H says, we have four large dogs. We have six foot fences that are padlocked on the um, outside of the, on the inside of the gate. Hurt my dogs, we hurt you. Yeah. Cottage Farm, she's emotional right now. Understandably, she needs the money to file a civil lawsuit. What's the GoFundMe? Uh, I, did Nicole, put, you I did put, put that in the comments of the YouTube, but I'll also okay. put it on Facebook and we'll add it to the story later. Yeah. Uh, Lolly Wilson says, prosecutors need to throw the book at him. Should have no bail. The guy's mother should be ashamed. Now, I, look, the no bail thing, I know that we all want that, right? When we're victims of a crime, it's all like, well, I want him locked up, throw away the key. You have a constitutional right to bail with conditions, but I do think that when you're talking about such a low amount, $10,000 means you put up $1,000 and you're out. And that's what happened for him. He was immediately out and back home right across the street from where he did this. And now you have this poor woman who can't even go back to her home, whose dog is dead, who's mortified, who's terrified. 
and he gets out for a thousand bucks. That's just not right. That's not commensurate with what he's accused of doing. And that's not commensurate with the mindset that someone has to be in to do what he's accused of doing. Uh, let's see here. Mary Christie. So the politicians better knock it off with their gun nonsense if this guy isn't brought up on a weapons charge. Again, at the very least. So we are still trying to figure out, did he lawfully own that firearm? Because I had heard a couple things from law enforcement that he might not. And I don't know yet for sure. So we're going to put a pin in that and come back mm -hmm. to it. But at the very least... You, sh you fired your gun in city limits, not in self-defense. That should at least right warrant there. some sort of charge related to your firearm. And again, you know, all these things, Bob Ferguson and guns, oh, we're saving lives mm -hmm. with our high capacity magazine ban. Dude, you're not saving any lives and you're not focused on what really matters. And that is making sure people who actually use guns to commit violent crimes and hurt people or hurt dogs or who use those guns to commit armed robberies that they are put away and that they have consequences to the fullest extent of the law. You, I, I have never heard you, Bob. I have never heard you speak out about that. You are entirely focused on law-abiding gun owners who are never going to break the laws that you put down. You are not focused on criminals and trying to make sure they're held accountable. So I just, it completely disingenuous. Completely disingenuous. Gun enhancements. That Gun enhancements. That they're a bargaining tool. Give me right. a break. Oh, yeah. We'll give you a deal, prosecutors. We'll give you a deal and we'll get rid of this five-year mandatory firearm enhancement. No. Yeah. Why do we have them then? Why do we have mandatory just, firearms, five-year sentences? Just to bargain. Just to bargain and say, hey, we don't want to go to trial, so we're going to cut this off. No. Crazy. You guys, mm -hmm. it makes no sense. Um, L3001 USPSA, you guys, you got to make these screen names easy for me to read. Why do they love making new gun laws, but they don't enforce them? Is it just to recategorize people like me as criminals? Yeah, probably. I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time. I, I get red pilled on a different <laughs> issue every month. I get and complimented for bringing you to the red side. <laughs> first of all, a red pill doesn't mean red side. Red <laughs> pill means you see the truth. And I really do believe that the government will try to take away mm -hmm. guns that were previously grandfathered in, like the semi-automatic assault yes. weapons, weapons of war, that they said, oh, if you already have one, you can keep it. You really think that they're not going to eventually try to take them away from you? With their, Speaking of what they do with their supermajority, right? right. Uh, on gun mags, Denise Jant says, these two stories today really underscore the insanity of government. They aggressively go after the rights of law-abiding citizens while almost completely ignoring an individual who aggressively perpetrates a senseless crime. Make criminals responsible for their behavior and stop going after law-abiding citizens. Amen, Denise, 100%. That sums it up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Chris to M, you do realize that the mags have nothing to do with irresponsible people breaking laws. Are you talking to me or just generally like Bob? Are, is she asking, do I, you, do I realize the I, mags I think have nothing to do with maybe irresponsible people yeah. breaking laws? Exactly. I mean, again, criminals don't follow laws. And so you having that, what they're trying to say is, oh, we want to keep that high capacity magazine from being purchased by someone who's going to use it to perpetrate a crime. But you already have, quote unquote, these sorts of magazines. I mean, remember we did the story of the young little gang members who wound up dead on the side of the road mm -hmm. in Seattle. And they had pictures of them with, I, th I think, two, four, five guns. And several of them had magazines that were against the law. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're 16, so they couldn't have the guns anyway. So clearly it's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, let me see here. Dems, Greg Anderson says... Uh, the state is going straight to communist rule if they get a supermajority. Uh, Kenneth, hey, Brandy, if the Democrats get a supermajority in Washington state, the only thing that will happen is the people that already feel we don't have a voice will move out of the state. Several of our friends have already left. We shouldn't have to, though. Such a beautiful state. And just to see it, absolutely. I know. There's so, and there's so many things here for people. And I'm not saying that, like, I mean, the great outdoors, everybody enjoys the great outdoors. You got the granola hippies who love going on a nice hike. You got the <laughs> conservatives who love to fish and hunt and, uh, and far do a lot of our farming and our ranching. And there's so many beautiful places for that. You shouldn't have to tuck tail and run. I know, but I do feel that. I see it and feel it. A lot of people have already left and a lot of people are saying, if something doesn't change this year, I can't even handle. I know. If Ferguson... Ugh. Ferguson People is are kind scared. of a, it, that is a hundred percent a moment of reckoning for mm -hmm. the state of Washington. Okay, those are all the questions and comments we're going to get to today. Oh my gosh, this story was going around over the weekend. I was like, we have to talk about this because it just sums up the things, the things that 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 people get outraged over. 
when there's so much happening that's actually worthy of outrage. Let's talk about it in our closing sanity check. All right. So I'm going to have Nicole help me walk through this a little bit. I'm trying to get mm-hmm. the, I'm just trying to get the graphic in. Oh, you didn't you put it in for me. Thank you, Nicole. You see how <laughs> when I'm stuck because I don't have something, I just throw Nicole under the bus. Although this one was actually her fault. Mm. So there was a dance team that had come into Seattle for something called the Emerald City Hoedown. Okay. And they were totally, they, they'd been trying to get this particular dance team to the Emerald City Hoedown for a couple of years. The pandemic made that difficult. Uh, and so they finally got to come this year. And this is in Seattle. Well, problem, their costumes, uniforms, outfits for the Emerald City Hoedown were patriotic in nature. They had stars and stripes and cowboy hats. <gasps> <gasps> oh, oh my How gosh, dare they? stars and stripes and blue jeans and cowboy hats and cowboy boots. <gasps> the horror oh in Seattle. So it's called the Borderline Dance Team. They put up a post on Facebook that reads as follows. Over the last two days, we've been answering dozens of calls and messages from friends and family. Feelings have ranged all the way from outrage to sympathy to disbelief. We want to make sure there is complete understanding and truth surrounding the events of Saturday. I'll try to make this as short as possible. Our dance team, along with a few others, were scheduled to perform at the Emerald City Hoedown in Seattle. They go on to say that, unfortunately, what our team was met with upon arrival was that our flag tops were offensive to some of the convention goers. There was a small group that felt, quote, triggered and unsafe. They had several claims for this reasoning, mostly associated with the situation in Palestine and the trans community in America. At first, we were told we would just be booed, yelled at, and likely many of them would walk out. This did not deter us. But then we were given an ultimatum remove the flag tops and perform in either street clothes, which most didn't bring as they traveled in the uniforms, or they would supply us with just shirts, hoedown shirts from years past. Or don't perform at all, which effectively was asking us to leave. Also, here is a link to their website that shows the pictures of our teams in our uniforms, so they would have known what we were going to wear. So you have a team that travels to Seattle for a dance competition, wears stars and stripes and cowboy hats, and we're given an ultimatum to either change or leave. Because a couple people said they were triggered. Because a couple people were triggered over Palestine and trans in America. How about those people leave? How about, I'm triggered over them being I triggered. Am, how, and that's the thing. I've done a story on it before. The weak war on reasonable people. You cannot allow fringe voices to wage war against reasonable people who are doing nothing wrong because it erodes it erodes the quality of life for everyone when you continue to give in to people like that unreal insane That has been your sanity check for today. And that has been today's episode of Undivided. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your commitment to giving Common Sense a comeback. I know it was a heavy start to the show today. Uh, Certainly, um, you know, our sympathy to, to Michelle and what she's going through. And we will continue to track that case and bring you any updates. We will see all of you back here on the live show tomorrow at noon.